Olaf was 19 years old when his journey started. He and his father left Stockholm in April 1829 to sail to Franz Josef Land. His father, a fisherman, had found some ivory tusks there that fetched a good price in Stockholm, and they were determined to return and collect some more. Once they arrived in Franz Josef Land, Olaf's father, feeling adventurous, suggested that they sail even further north. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me they were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than any that mortal man had ever known, and that it was inhabited by the chosen. My youthful imagination was fired by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I exclaimed, why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind favorable, and the sea open. Even now, I can see the expression of pleasurable surprise on his countenance as he turned toward me and asked, my son, are you willing to go with me and explore, to go far beyond where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively. Very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. And quickly adjusting the sails, he glanced at our compass, turned the prow in due northerly direction through an open channel, and our voyage began. The excitement was real, and after nearly 30 hours of sailing and a heavy meal, the duo fell asleep, only to be awakened by a furious storm. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at terrific speed, and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was arriving in convulsions. By what miracle we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned as if its joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro, as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlpool and maelstrom. This terrible, nerve-wracking ordeal, with its nameless horrors of suspense and agony of fear undescribable, continued for more than three hours, and all the time we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then, suddenly, as if growing weary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury, and by degrees, it died down. The storm had dumped a third of their provisions and all of their water. They were desperate and lost at sea when strange things started to happen. I tried to forget my thirst by busying myself in bringing up some food and an empty vessel from the hold. Reaching over the side rail, I filled the vessel with water for the purpose of laving my hands and face. To my astonishment, when the water came in contact with my lips, I could taste no salt. I was startled by the discovery. Father, I fairly gasped, the water, the water, it's fresh. What, Olaf, exclaimed my father, glancing hastily around. Surely you are mistaken. There is no land. You are going mad. But taste it, I cried. And thus we made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh. Absolutely so. Without the least briny taste or even the suspicion of a salty flavor. Not only was the water somehow drinkable, but their compass was also acting strange. We had scarcely appeased our hunger when a breeze began to fill the idle sails. And glancing at the compass, we found the northerly point pressing hard against the glass. In response to my surprise, my father said, I have heard of this before. It is what they call the dipping of the needle. We loosened the compass and turned it at right angles with the surface of the sea before its point would free itself from the glass and point accordingly to an unmolested attraction. It shifted uneasily and seemed as unsteady as a drunken man, but finally pointed a course. Before this, we thought the wind was carrying us north by northwest, but with the needle free, we discovered, if it could be relied upon, that we were sailing slightly north by northeast. Our course, however, was ever trending northward. And that wasn't all. There was a new sun in the sky. One day, about this time, my father startled me by calling my attention to a novel sight far in front of us, almost at the horizon. It's a mock sun, explained my father. I have read of them. It is called a reflection or a mirage. It will soon pass away. 
this dull, red, false sun as we supposed it to be, did not pass away for several hours, and while we were unconscious of its emitting any rays of light, still there was no time thereafter when we could not sweep the horizon in front and locate the illumination of the so-called false sun during a period of at least 12 hours out of every 24. Clouds and mists would at times almost and never entirely hide its location. Gradually, it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of the uncertain purple sky as we advanced. It could hardly be said to resemble the sun, except in its circular shape. And when not obscured by clouds or the ocean mists, it had a hazy red bronze appearance, which could change to a white like a luminous cloud, as if reflecting some greater light beyond. We finally agreed in our discussion on this smoky, furnace-colored sun that whatever the cause of the phenomenon, it was not a reflection of our sun, but a planet of some sort, a reality. A few days later, land appeared, and as they came closer in, they discovered a river inlet. They continued their journey down the river for several more days, eventually encountering another ship. Here's where the story really starts to get strange. The ship was huge, and so were its occupants. The immense craft paused, and almost immediately a boat was lowered, and six men of gigantic stature rowed to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew from their manner, however, that they were not unfriendly. They talked a great deal among themselves, and one of them laughed immoderately, as though in finding us a queer discovery had been made. Olaf and his father were invited to board their ship, and there they discovered that there were several hundred occupants aboard, all looking at them with amazement. If my father and I were curiously observed by the ship's occupants, this strange race of giants offered us an equal amount of wonderment. There was not a single man on board who would not have measured fully 12 feet in height. They all wore full beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair, with ruddy complexions. The hair and the beard of some were black, others sandy, and still others yellow. The captain, as we designated the dignitary in command of the great vessel, was fully a head taller than any of his companions. The women averaged from 10 to 11 feet in height. Their features were especially regular and refined, while their complexion was of a most delicate tint heightened by a helpful glow. Olaf and his father felt safe with their strange new companions, and Jens was convinced that they had traveled to the legendary lands of the North Winds. Olaf and Jens lived among these people for two years, learning their language and their culture. Here they learned about electricity. The ship was equipped with a mode of illumination which I now presume was electricity, but neither my father nor myself were sufficiently skilled in mechanics to understand whence came the power to operate the ship, or to maintain the soft, beautiful lights that answered the same purpose of our present methods of lighting the streets of our cities, our houses, and our places of business. It must be remembered, the time of which I write is the autumn of 1829, and we, of the outside surface of the earth, knew nothing then, so to speak, of electricity. They also saw great displays of gold. I never saw such a display of gold. It was everywhere. The door casings were inlaid and the tables were veneered with sheetings of gold. Domes of the public buildings were of gold. It was used most generously in the furnishings of the great temples of music. They also saw great displays of vegetation of mammoth proportions. Vegetation grew in lavish exuberance, and fruit of all kinds possessed the most delicate flavor. Clusters of grapes, four and five feet in length, each grape as large as an orange, and apples larger than a man's head, typified the wonderful growth of all things on the inside of the earth. The great redwood trees of California would be considered mere underbrush compared to the giant forest trees extending for miles and miles in all directions. They also learned about the central sun, or what the people called the smoky god. The great luminous cloud, or ball of dull fire, fiery red in the mornings and evenings, and during the day giving off a beautiful white light, the smoky god, is seemingly suspended in the center of the great vacuum within the earth, 
and held in its place by a mutable law of gravitation or a repellent atmospheric force, as the case may be. I refer to the known power that draws or repels mutable force in all directions. The base of this electrical cloud or central luminary, the seat of the gods, is dark and non-transparent, save for innumerable small openings seemingly in the bottom of the great support or altar of the deity upon which the smoky god rests and the lights shining through these many openings twinkle at night in all their splendor and seem to be stars as natural as the stars we saw shining when we were at home in stockholm except that they appear larger the smoky god therefore with each daily revolution of the earth appears to come up in the east and go down in the west the same as does our sun on the external surface. In reality, the people within believe that the smoky god is the throne of Jehovah and is stationary. The effect of night and day is therefore produced by the Earth's daily rotation. After living among the people for a year and learning their language, they were called to appear before the great high priest, the ruler of the inner earth. They traveled to the city of Eden to meet him on a monorail. This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contrivance. It was noiseless and ran on a single rail in perfect balance. The trip was made at a very high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down dales, across valleys and again along the sides of steep mountains, without any apparent attempt having been made to level the earth as we do for railroad tracks. In the city of Eden, they viewed a great artesian fountain, which was said to be the source of the four great rivers, the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hydekel. They spent nearly two hours in an interview with the great high priest, who finished his interview with a final question. At the conclusion of the interview, he inquired our pleasure, asking us whether we would wish to remain in his country or if we preferred to return to the outer world providing it were possible to make a successful return trip across the frozen belt barriers that encircled both the northern and the southern openings of the earth. My father replied, It would please me and my son to visit your country and see your people, your colleges and places of music and art, your great fields, your wonderful forests of timber, and after we have had this pleasurable privilege, we should like to try to return to our home on the outside surface of the earth. This son is my only child and my good wife will be weary waiting our return. They lived among the people for another year, traveling and seeing all the inner earth had to offer. This included art, culture, and music. The people were exceedingly musical and learned to a remarkable degree in their arts and sciences, especially geometry and astronomy. Their cities are equipped with vast palaces of music where not infrequently as many as 25,000 lusty voices of this giant race swell forth in mighty choruses of the most sublime symphonies. Their principal vocations are architecture, agriculture, horticulture, and the raising of herds and cattle, and the building of conveyances peculiar to that country for travel on land and water. They also viewed massive species of animals, including large birds, turtles, and elephants. Whether inland, among the mountains, or along the seashore, we found bird life prolific. When they spread their great wings, some of the birds appeared to measure 30 feet from tip to tip. They are of great variety and many colors. Their host, Professor Galdea, took them to an inlet where they saw thousands of tortoises along the sandy shore. I hesitate to state the size of these great creatures. They were from 25 to 30 feet in length. 15 to 20 feet in width and fully 7 feet in height. When one of them projected its head, it had the appearance of some hideous sea monster. One day, we saw a great herd of elephants. There must have been 500 of these little throated monsters with their restlessly waving trunks. They were tearing huge boughs from the trees and trampling smaller growth into dust. They would average over 100 feet in length and from 75 to 85 feet in height. Then after two years, it was time to return home. After having spent considerably more than a year and visiting several of the many cities of the within world and a great deal of intervening country, and more than two years had passed from the time we had been picked up by the great excursion ship on the river, we decided to cast our fortunes once more upon the sea 
and endeavor to regain the outside surface of the earth. We had made known our wishes, and they were reluctantly but promptly followed. Our hosts gave my father, at his request, various maps showing the entire inside surface of the earth, its cities, oceans, seas, rivers, gulfs, and bays. They also generously offered to give us all the bags of gold nuggets, some of them as large spruce eggs that we were willing to attempt to take with us in our little fishing boat. After our giant brothers had launched our little craft for us, they were most cordially regretful at parting and evinced much solicitude for our safety. The journey home was treacherous, and unfortunately their small vessel succumbed to the barrage of an iceberg. Olaf was stranded and his father was killed. Miraculously, Olaf was rescued by a Scottish whaling ship and eventually returned home, but as previously stated, his life was not happy. While heavily debated as fiction or non-fiction, Olaf's story, while tragic, is certainly interesting nonetheless. Could it be real? Could a civilization be living far into the north winds? 